Good morning, everyone. Let me add my welcome to uh, the ones we've already had. So I think you already understand why I'm up here. My name is Mike Hartke, and our pastors have both been away for the last several days enjoying the, uh, apparently the weather and the sunshine in Traverse City. So uh, as we do that, as we go forward, I'm going to deliver the message this morning. So if you'll join me for a moment of prayer, please. Gracious and good God, we offer our praise and worship to you this morning as we trust in your promise of being amongst us as we gather in your holy and blessed name. Open our hearts and our minds to your calling as we worship you, allowing the Holy Spirit into, your, into our hearts. Thank you for this time together to worship you and to fellowship as believers. So the title of today's message is 70 Times 7. It's from our series of forgiveness, and today's scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. And I think it's interesting that Peter uses seven because that's one of those perfect whole numbers in Jewish literature and history. But the real truth was at that time, three would have been the rabbinical number. You only have to forgive somebody three times. Yet Jesus says seven times 70. So is Jesus telling us that you have to forgive 490 times? And then when 491 rolls around, you're kind of done, you're off the hook, you get to quit? I don't think so. I think he's using a ridiculous number. At the time, it would have been considered metaphorical. It's a number that would have not been taken literally, but figuratively. It means a very large number. So what Jesus is telling us is that don't ever stop forgiving. So I know that's a lot easier said than done. I am very familiar with that. In a lot of cases, there are those little slights. Those are pretty easy to forgive. Then there are those not so little slights that maybe are a little harder to forgive. And then there are the really big ones. I mean, the ones that are just too big and too hurtful to turn away from. And you have to ask yourself, what can I do to let go and forgive that person? Well, I'd like to take a look at all three of those scenarios this morning, kind of break them down a little bit as we go along. So let's start with the small things. So a lot of things fall into the small category. For me, and I'm pretty sure most of you out there, driving. Oh my goodness, what a frustrating experience. So I'm always tempted to lash out at people that can't drive quite as good as I do, because obviously, I mean, come on, you've driven behind me probably. So I've kind of been less than complimentary to those folks in the past, but I'm trying to get better at that. My wife is helping me. She's doing a good job too, by the way. So here's what I'm using these days. I use the example of my mother. So for many years, my mom wouldn't drive. She wouldn't drive a car for a small slight that she could never forgive. So I'm not sure if my parents owned or just worked at this small grocery store but my mother was backing a truck up to pick up some bottles. They're the glass type of bottles. And back in those days, you'd return the glass bottles, they'd wash them out and return them, fill them up and return them back out. To that I say yuck today, but that's how they did it back then. Anyway, as she was backing up, she knocked the bottles over. She got laughed at. Well, she said then she vowed at that point that she would never drive again wasn't really a big deal, but it was to her. So she kept that promise, and she kept that promise until she was in, I'm thinking probably her mid-60s, from her early 20s, so that's a long time to keep a promise. And eventually, my brother bought her a car and taught her to drive, and um, along the way, I'm sure she got to be an adequate driver, but I'm pretty sure she never was a really good, confident driver. So every time I get behind one of those folks that I want to kind of be mad at, I think about my mom, and I think about how she could have been driving ahead of me and how I would have to forgive her. So in Adam Hamilton's book, Forgiveness, he talks about a short phrase called R-A-P. 
And he says, remember your own shortcomings, assume the best in people, and probably most importantly, pray for them. Now, I recognize that forgiveness can be a lot easier said than done. So for small things, it's probably pretty easy, but some things are not so small. And rather than to use the term forgive, you might just say that you ignored them or you overlooked it. But some things aren't quite that easy. They aren't quite that simple. They're a little bit harder to brush off. And when we have to forgive something that's not quite as easy as a small annoyance, it's a little bit harder. So one of the things that came to my mind as I was thinking about this was, now today, in retrospect, many years later, it's a pretty minor thing, but at the time, it seemed like a big deal to me. My daughter was in high school, she had a curfew of midnight on weekends, and she was usually pretty good at it, so I didn't worry a whole lot. But now we're talking about pre-cell phone days, so these are ancient times for, for many of the younger people in here. But she was late, and I was concerned. And we'd talked about it a number of times, but midnight started to become sort of a suggested arrival time home rather than a firm rule. For me, midnight's locked in, that's that. I worried about her, and I worried about her a lot. And it was tough for me to go to bed until she got home. So I was usually up wandering around the house waiting for the door to open. So one night, she got, a, she got home late, not really late, probably 30 minutes or so, and uh, I said, that's it, you're grounded. Well, that turned into a very lengthy discussion, leading to the small hours of the morning, <clears throat> and eventually with a lot of tears and angst and a lot of anxiety. For me, it wasn't particularly about her being late, it was more about the fact that I was worried. Now, here's where this gets just a little tricky in this whole forgiveness thing. I had to forgive her as a young high school student with a really small transgression, and frankly, it made me worry. Those were the things I was concerned about. So by forgiving her, I gave myself the freedom to not have to think or worry about that problem anymore. But now we are up against, is forgiving the same as condoning? See, I didn't condone her behavior, but I did forgive. And the fact that she was late on several occasions was fine, but in this case, um, my forgiveness hadn't extended seven times 70, but I'd done it a few times. So did that dismiss the consequences? Well, unfortunately for her, the answer was no. I mean, she was still grounded. And I related this story to her, her earlier. In fact, it was on Mother's Day, we were having brunch together, and I said I was gonna talk about that incident. And I thought it was really interesting. I didn't give her the details. I thought it was really interesting. She asked me, who did the forgiving in this story? That was really insightful to me. Apparently, forgiveness is a two-way street. It kind of depends on your vantage point. And apparently, in that scenario, I needed as much forgiveness as she did. To me, that's a lesson I'm gonna to have to take to heart for the rest of my life. Forgiving doesn't mean consequences don't apply. And this obviously applies to big things. I mean, if somebody steals something from you, there are consequences. There are real world, world consequences that have to be dealt with. And what about that person that doesn't repent or ask for forgiveness or need or want forgiveness? Is the goal to lift the burden from the other person or is it to allow us individually to move on. In Matthew 18, there's a process that is used for reconciliation in the, within the church, and it's probably a pretty good model for us to think about when we feel wronged by another person. So let's take a look at that scripture. This is Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Just between you, the two of you, if they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if the, and if the church, and if, they, and if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So the biblical process for reconciliation is a three-step process. First, you approach the person one-on-one. -on -one. You make your case. Second of all, bring somebody along, speak to the other person, and discern what the truth of the matter really is. And finally, bring it to a larger body of believers. So I think 
if we understand this a little better, when this was written, the church was pretty small. It was maybe 120 people. So that meant every wrong was kind of a very personal thing, and everybody knew everybody. So in today's church, we might not be the same. We have bigger churches. We have more people involved. But the real takeaway is that by confirming your perception that you have been wronged, you may reveal, in fact, that you are the one who's in the wrong. And sometimes a fresh set of eyes on a problem creates a whole new vantage point for that, for that situation. And finally, the third step is Jesus said to treat them like a pagan or a tax collector. Now, to me, at first glance, that sounds pretty darn harsh. And it says that you're to exclude them from fellowship until, until you realize that Jesus spent most of his time with the very people he's telling you to treat them as, pagans and tax collectors. So for me, the implication is that you're not to shun them, but you're to bring them back into fellowship, just as Jesus did. So this biblical method for sorting out problems it's a, is a process that can be beneficial, but only if you do it from a place of love and forgiveness and caring. And I would suggest that before you confront anyone, you think about it, T-H-I-N-K. So when you approach that person, is it true? And I don't mean it's how you feel. I mean, is it really true? And even if it is, ask yourself, is this helpful? I mean, does this really make a difference? And will it change anything if I move forward with this? An I, is it inspiring? In other words, does it help the other person? Or does it help you gain a better understanding of the situation? And ask yourself, and is it necessary? Is this something that really can't be reconciled? Without, without bringing it into the light of day? And finally, is it kind? How do you approach that person? Do you approach them with humility and forgiveness, or do you come at them with anger and reproach? Now, what about the really, really big things? What about the things that are just almost impossible to get through? What about those things that just permeate your being to a level where you just can't move on? Well, I have an example that's pretty close to home. Uh, my example of how not to behave was my grandmother. She had three sons, Edward, who was my dad, Clifford, who was one of my uncles, and Norman, who was another uncle. Well, at some point, my grandmother got angry at Norman. She said she'd never speak with him again, and she never did. Well, since she lived with us, that put a kind of a heavy burden on my dad as well. He was obligated to honor that, I think. So I had no idea for the longest time that I had another uncle, I had no idea I had cousins, and I had no idea where they lived or who they were or anything about them, until at my grandmother's funeral, a fellow came up to me and shook my hand and he said, hi, my name is Mike Hartke. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I kind of looked at him funny and it turns out that he, sure enough, was a cousin from my uncle Norman and uh, the uncle that my grandmother had ostracized for literally most of my life. So. It's a sad thing when forgiveness can't somehow be found in the small things that are so unobtrusive. So I never really did find out what the real reason was for that. I talked to my mom once and she said it was a pretty small slight. I think she got in an argument and that small argument led to a lifetime of hurt for both my uncle's family and for those of us that would have liked to get to know them. So those are the kinds of things that take small things and turn them into big things that don't get resolved. Things that could have been so easily solved by just an ounce of forgiveness early on. And then there are the really, really, I'm going to add another one in here, really big things. Let me share a story of a woman whose name is Faith Brown. She suffered what I think might be one of the most horrendous acts I have ever encountered in my life. This woman was married. She had four children with her husband. And they had an argument, as many, most, I would say, married couples do at one time or another. Well, she didn't realize how serious that argument was and how serious he was about it until he came home and he killed all four of the children and attempted to kill her. The really sad thing was that the exact, that man had been convicted of that exact same crime many years before. And he had been in prison prior to meeting him. So her book, she wrote a book, and her book details this entire episode. And she talks in that book about putting her life back together and getting back onto a road of what she calls a new normal. 
So she was at a First Step event that we attended several months ago, and she told her story. And I'll tell you, when she finished, you could hear a pin drop in that auditorium. And there was a lot of dry, not dry eyes in the auditorium as well. In fact, it was so moving that the person that was running the event, the, the host, actually had to take five or six minutes to compose herself before she could get back into it. Now, I'm not certain if faith can forgive such a huge loss, but I do know that Jesus is the way. See, in practicing forgiveness, we follow the example set by Jesus himself. Throughout his ministry, he embodied the essence of forgiveness. In fact, from the cross, he uttered the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, in the face of his murder and in the face of betrayal and cruelty. See, forgiveness in the eyes of Christ isn't a sign of weakness, but it's a sign of strength. And it takes courage, and it takes humility to get rid of resentment, to release that grip of anger, and to offer pardon to those who have wronged us. It's a process that requires us to confront our own pain, to heal our own wounds, and to extend compassion to other folks. See, forgiveness is the ultimate cleansing of the hurt from our soul. It's the way we find freedom in the world that frequently strives to steal our joy. It becomes our own very personal way to right the wrongs that we perceive around us. And how can we be, be, be preoccupied with our own personal hurts if we've given them up and we've chosen to be a loving and caring person even to the ones who've hurt us? And how do we continue to hold on to hurt when we are earnestly praying for the person that inflicted it. Perhaps with enough prayer, we can find that the injustice that we perceive was of our own doing. Maybe the person we need to forgive is ourselves for being a false witness, even if that false witness never saw the light of day and it was just in our minds. I've heard that if you do something for 21 days, it becomes a habit. I think maybe that's what Jesus was telling us in his infinite wisdom. Maybe he's telling us if we forgive enough, we can create a new habit of forgiveness, and along with that, a habit of overlooking the worst in people and focusing on the best in people. We can focus on the things that make them who they are and understand that perhaps we need to receive more forgiveness than we can offer, no matter how much we try. One of the things I know for sure is that lack of forgiveness can pollute your own soul. It creates bitterness. It creates resentment. It creates a wall between our better selves and our resentful nature. It can drive us away from God toward our own sinful nature. And here's the problem with sin. It leads you where you don't want to be. It takes you deeper than you want to go. And it keeps you longer than you want to stay. And sometimes the only way out of that awful place of sin and remorse is forgiveness. First, forgiveness offered by you to whoever wronged you, and probably more importantly, forgiveness offered that only God can provide, seeing you as a child loved by him and seen through the lens of his son, Jesus Christ. So maybe today, perhaps today, is the one day that you can let go of that one big hurt, or maybe a small hurt that's been bothering you for a while. Maybe today is the day that you can start making a forgiveness a part of your being. And when you do, you might find that you're able to live in a freedom that only Jesus, the Christ, can provide. Amen?